Next question. In light of um, what we talked about this morning, what should our evangelism look like? That's a very good question. First of all, you're speaking about... Oh, the question is, what should our evangelism look like in light of what we learned this morning about true conversion? First of all, when you're dealing with people, you must be there not only for the glory of God, which should be primarily, but your concern and honest love for people. In that, you ought to recognize that you are a servant. You are a servant. Not only to God, but to those people. The graces of the Christian life ought to shine forth in your life. And that means... I'll just, just give you some examples. You know, before I was a Christian, I could, you know, I wasn't afraid really to talk to people. You know, I walk in, someone's sitting on a bench there at school, I'd sit down, hey, how's it going? Alright, may I see the ball game last night? Just a normal guy. Then I became a Christian. And it's like I totally freaked out. You see a guy on a bench, normal guy, before you were a Christian and knew you needed to witness to somebody, you see him on a bench, you sit down, hey, what's up? Start talking, right? But now you're a Christian. You look at him and you start sweating. And your eyes get big. He looks up at you and you look like the children of the corn coming at him. I mean, he, he, it's just like, oh my gosh, there's one of those events. Run! So, here's, here's one of the things that I realize is I, I'm called to serve that person. So, I'm probably going to sit down, just normal. Hey, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. Just start talking to him. Asking him questions. Just a normal conversation. You know, normal is a really good word. Just normal. About anything. Get to know him, stuff like that. Now, I've got to make some determinations here also. First of all, you should always be praying according to Colossians chapter 4 that God would open up a door. Always. That is a dangerous prayer because you ask Him, He'll open them. Alright, so you're praying, God open up a door and trust in His sovereignty. That means you're not going to knock the door down in this guy's life. Okay? Now you're not going to be a coward, but you're not going to knock down the door. So you start talking to Him and you, you, I ask myself this, I'm on a plane, okay? That's different than, alright, I'm not going to build a long-term relationship with this person. I'm not. But if you're in a school or something, that could be different. You build a long-term relationship. While you're talking to them the first time, you might pray, God, open up a door. Maybe God will, and that'd be great. Maybe He won't. But you're sitting there going, long-term, long-term relationship. With this guy over here, I'm going to be talking to him. I'm going to kind of do what uh, one of the Navigators guys said that one time that I thought was really good. He says, I work my way around the rim of someone's life and I look for a crack. That's pretty good. But... I'm not going to be sneaky. I'm not because they can tell when you've snuck in something on them. They really can. So I'm going to talk to them. If a door opens up, I'm going to go through it. If it doesn't open up, I'm liable to do something like this. You know, we just got. You know, we're on this plane trip. It's really been a good conversation with you. And because I know, look, the door's not opening up. Look, I'm, I'm a Christian. And I know that probably brings a lot of things into your mind with all these TV evangelists and everything that are out there, but would you mind if just for a few minutes I shared the Gospel with you? Now look what I'm doing. I'm not trying to be sneaky. I'm not trying to sneak in a way to kind of open up the door. I'm just being honest. Would you mind? And I find that people, even when they don't really like this, they respect that a lot more than me trying to sneak one in on them. You know, find a sneaky way to enter in. So I just sit down. Can I share with you the Gospel? I like what John MacArthur does, from what I understand. I've never heard him say this, but another guy shared with me. He said that Dr. MacArthur will just say to people, have you ever really understood the Gospel? Matter of fact, I did that to a Vietnamese guy on the flight over here. I said, have you ever really understood the Gospel? And he said, no. And I said, well, let me explain it to you. One time... I was coming back from Amsterdam and I got on a plane, sat down beside this guy. Looked like kind of a pretty distinguished guy, you know. And I sat down beside him. He goes, uh, what do you do? And I said, well, I teach the Bible. I, I preach and things like that. And, 
And I quoted a few things. And since we were there in that area, I said, yeah, like Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch Reform guy, said. He goes, you know, I'm, I'm Dutch Reformed. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. And, and he goes, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> And he said, this what he was an aide to George Bush Sr. at the time. And this is what he said to me. Our plane had just taken off. He said, uh, I tell you what, he goes, we had about six hours before we hit Washington. He goes, could you explain to me just the history of Christianity and what all this is about? I said, well, I would be happy to. <laughs> so sometimes you know that happens. But I'll, I'll, that's one of the best ways. is just to say, can I share the gospel with you? And if they say no, go... Okay. And then be nice to them. But if they say yes, then I always begin with this. I find the best place to begin is not with man, but with God. And I will say to them, first of all, the gospel is the good news. That's what the word means. But let me lay the whole scenario out for you. The gospel begins, this whole thing about Christ and sin and the cross, it begins with the nature of God. Here is the great problem in all the Scripture. If you ever want to know what the Scripture is about, it's about this one problem. If God is a just God, He can't forgive you. And people say, well, I don't see why... I mean, why is that such... I said, think about it. Then I'll use illustrations from our own courts of law about if we're always complaining about corrupt judges, they let criminals go, they forgive them, they do all this stuff when they're supposed to do justice. And I get them to see that that they need God to be just. They want God to be just. See, when you mention holiness and everything else, unbeliever's mind with the devil working, he's always thinking, oh, yeah, he's going to show me this God who just wants to cramp my lifestyle and force me into all this stuff. And I go, look, you want a holy, righteous God. Now, why would I want that? Well, would you want someone with all power to be like Hitler? Well, no. Wouldn't you want him to be righteous? Would you like him to act against the evils in this world? They're going, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we need. Well, now here's the next thing. Your evil in this world. Let's talk about it. And then begin to deal with that. And then put before them, here is the problem. God is just and good and loving. You're none of those things. Now, how can God forgive you and still be just? And then I'm going to give them something that even Martin Lloyd-Jones said, I can't explain it, it's just in Scripture. But God chose to put away this problem through becoming a man and dying upon a tree, and I, I go through that. And then I explain the resurrection, and I explain that, you, sir, you must repent and believe. Sometimes at that point, a lot of times... It just goes off from there and they go, okay, I gave you your five minutes, thank you. Sometimes it goes into, you know, the whole plane trip. Or people telling me, I'd like to talk more with you about this. So, that's the way I always go. Begin with the nature of God and His justice. And the problem of justice and man's evil. Work very hard. Don't move from this witnessing thing until they've accepted, they've begun to realize their wickedness. Or at least it's been clearly explained. Go on to the cross and then what they must do. Now, there have been times when even on a plane... I mean, I I was with a guy on a plane a couple years ago and he said, I said, you really need to think about these things. And he said, no, I don't. I need to get saved. And I said, he said, how do I get... I said, you know, I mean, he was was broken over his sin. I said, call on the Lord. Ask Him to save you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I read through some prophecy. Man, he cried out to God right on the plane. Tears coming down his face, everything. You know, and it, he said, God saved me. And now this is extremely important. I said, sir, if you have believed in Jesus Christ with all your heart, He has saved you. But now, then I take him through the book of First John and say, if He has truly saved you, this is, bego- this is going to begin to happen in your life. But as you go out from this plane and everything else, if none of these changes become apparent in your life, then you've got nothing here today. Because I don't want that guy being addressed by maybe some godly preacher five years from now, and he's living in sin, and that preacher comes up to him, tries to witness to him, and he says, look, don't worry about me. You know, I was on a plane with Brother Paul, and I'm saved. I don't want that happening. So that's kind of... Okay, next question.